Hey guys, welcome back today to Day Chest. This is Sabina and this is the bonus of today. The reason I'm doing this is not only because I really like you guys and I want to analyze a new game, but also because I know I let you down a little bit not being able to post for uh, a couple of days. So here's my bonus video to kind of make up a little bit for the days that I was unable to post. And for today's bonus, basically I chose the game between Vesen and Topalov and Anish Giri played in the London Chess Classic two days ago, so on December 4th, in the first round of the tournament. For those of you who haven't started checking out this tournament yet, be sure you check it out. It's the last Grand Prix tournament of the year, so um, all of the top players, I mean, the top players basically are playing there, and uh, there are so many interesting games and so many fights that I think it's definitely worth watching. Of course, I'll be covering some of the um, games, so hopefully you stay tuned like usually on my YouTube channel. And additionally, hopefully you check out my website, daytodaycookingofagrandmaster.com. I also have a blog there where I'm mixing both chess and cooking, so if you have any ideas, be sure to write me an email or write me on Facebook or whatever means of communication you might want to uh, to have and just give me the ideas. Like I said in other videos, I'm really grateful for those who uh, share ideas with me and I'm trying as much as I can to slowly incorporate them in my um, videos. Okay, so having said that, let us start with the beginning of the game. Um, here, Topalov started with d4. And he played g3 in this position. The idea is, of course, he probably wanted to avoid the Grunfeld. So he played g3 to kind of avoid d5. And Giri decided to play c6, not to go for king, uh, bishop g7 and play some king's Indian with g3, but rather c6 and get some Schlechter after d5. And here Topalov went uh, bishop g2, d5, queen a4. This idea is, of course, very clear. I pinned the c pawn to be able to take in d5 and not allow black to capture back with the pawn. And here, the most uh, prominent moves that one could consider are, of course, to take in c4, and after queen takes c4, bishop g7, and eventually black is going to um, try to open up the center at some point, breaking through with c5 or e5. And some other idea maybe would be to uh, play knight bd7, and now if black... If, sorry, if white captures in d5, we can go knight b6, the queen goes back, and she takes d5. But um, Giri, Anish, came up with a new idea. Instead of knight bd7, he decided to go knight f to d7. Basically with the same idea to play knight b6 in case of capture. But also he wanted to maintain both of his knights on the queen side, which is some new idea that um, I really enjoyed. Here, of course, he will want to develop the knight in c6, bishop g7. And that's exactly what happened in the game. And here I was a little bit um, surprised by Topalov's move e3. I think uh, white should not hurry in making this move because with e3 he's closing the bishop in c1. So that bishop will not have any opportunities to get out on this diagonal. And why do so? I mean, nobody's forcing. There are no direct threats just yet. Why, why playing e3? I feel that there other moves that could be considered here maybe like b3 to try to keep this knight in b6 closed or a4 maybe in this position and um, if um, black would play bishop g7 to put pressure in d4 we can play a5 first um, and so you know this this would be my approach to this position if I were white but to of went for e3 which like I said personally positionally speaking I don't like it that much Bishop g7, knight e2, castle, castle, and here what to do. The position seems quite symmetrical, so, you know, whoever wants to try to play for a win, they have to find some breakthroughs to open up the position a little bit and start some attack. And so in this position, Anish Giri played rook to e8 with the idea to play some e5 and open up his bishop from g7. b3 was Topalov's response, e5. Of course, we have to capture here. I mean, otherwise, black can even think of pushing e4 and getting more space. Takes, takes, and now we have created a weakness in d5. 
But for how long? I mean, can we actually do something about it? And it's not very clear how, uh, for why. In general, we want to blockade a pawn that's um, isolated just for some time, just to be sure uh, the opponent will not be able to push that pawn and get rid of it. So maybe knight e4 would have been a, a nice approach here. But Topalov played h3 first, not to allow any pins or, you know, ideas with knight g4. So uh, bishop f5 was played, and now knight d4. It actually comes with tempo. But the problem is that here black has this bishop d3, rook e1, and bishop a6. Maybe the bishop doesn't look that great in a6, but of course... Um, opens up the space for the knight. Knight d3 would look really great for black in this position. So um, it's a little bit tough here for white to really find the best continuation. I feel that it's um, almost impossible to stop knight d3. We definitely don't want to consider a move like bishop f1 because once the bishop gets traded, white will be weak around the king on the light square. So um, specifically in this position, there's even queen c8 double attack. So, you know, bishop f1 definitely comes out of any considerations for white. So there's really no way to stop knight d3. So we have to think how we want to actually uh, utilize, I mean, how to react against knight d3. And to of play queen d2, um, I was thinking maybe in this position try bishop e2, but it's really not, I mean, you're not really doing much with bishop b 2 because Knight d3 is still possible, and after uh, rook e2, black is of course not going to take that bishop, but to play rook c8, get the control over the c-file, you know, this position is very good for black. So, um, queen d2 was his um, his choice. Queen c2 was another possibility. It basically gets um, to a similar position. Knight d3, rook d1. Um, so it's better to have the rook in d1 than in e2, because in d1 at least white is, is ready to eventually attack the pawn d5. And here, Giri took in d4, which I like, because although we're giving the dark square bishop from around the king, we're actually getting rid of our weakness in d5. Now queen f6, little pressure here in d4, and a of played a4. And of course, we take the pawn, that was the idea. There's no way actually here for white to, to defend that pawn that, that would be good. So it's, we're better off with white to just give it away temporarily to later be able to capture this one. So, you know, okay, the position is about equal and stays that way. I mean, of course, if both players play well, the position should end in a draw, right? So, a4, and here, Giryanish took in d4. Very normal uh, move to take the pawn, right? And here, a5 was the pawn of choice. Um, I was thinking here, knight b5 would be some idea, but really it does not work because we're just giving away the rook. And now knight c7 really doesn't do much because we just gave away a rook and even if we take something here, they want, nothing would be happening. So. Bishop f1 was another choice, and actually a really good choice. Knight b5, there's nothing about that move. Uh, but bishop f1 is really interesting here with white. Um, giving away the bishop, yes, but at least trying to get rid of this knight in d3. That's super annoying. Attacking f2, you know, controlling e1, c1. White will not be able to trade any material. And just white also won't be able to, to attack d5. But... 97 could have been the response by black. And now we want to bring the knight to e5 or c5. And, you know, capturing here won't really bring much because rook e1 check, king g2, rook takes d1. So this could be actually a position that would arise. And this would probably... Uh, finish in a draw after bishop e3. White is eventually going to get that pawn back or get the rook super active um, and activate it on the seventh rank with a really good position. So this was a really good solution for white. However, Topalov played a5, which is still good. Knight d7, and here rook a4. 
a really nice way and creative way to activate the rook because otherwise how would this rook get into play? There's no way, right? So rook a4, queen e5, and here knight takes d5. So white eventually did get their pawn back. And I was a little bit like a little bit more surprised by Girianish's choice of taking this bishop in c1. I do not understand why he did, he made this move. He seems to be a really good positional player, and this is not the type of move that you would think of playing, because that knight has moved, I mean, four times, right? I mean, three times plus capturing four times. Why, why would we take that bishop that didn't move at all and doesn't seem to have a really good place to bring it? Why not just play knight c5, keeping our knight super strong there, attacking the rook, um, you know, being able to later bring the rook to d8. There's really strengthening the knight in d3. This just seems like a really good idea for, for black. And, you know, if rook h4, there's really, I don't think there's anything to worry about. In the worst case, we can take now. Uh, here and then think of some knight d3 maybe or uh, maybe not knight d3 d directly because there will be some queen h6 but um, in this position possibly we could have this move because if queen h6 we're simply winning material there's no mate here there's no mate the queen controls h8 and also can come back to g7 so just bishop e2, chase the rook away for some time, uh, but where do you go? I mean, it's not even clear. Let's say rook d4, and here, you know, maybe we can even take in b3. I mean, it's a little bit to calculate, but it seems to be quite, uh, quite all right for black. Just knight c5. Instead, knight takes c1 seems to me like a very bad positional choice by black. And um, rook takes c1, knight f6. And here, Topalov, surprise, I mean, we know that he's an aggressive tactical player, so his move might be understandable why he made it. He played knight c7 here. But um, the easiest way to, to continue here possibly would be just take. Takes and rook f4. I mean, we have to try to get to a position where we are comfortable playing and where our opponent is just remains with weaknesses. I mean, that's my approach and so f7 is weak right then this bishop in a6 was great at the time that there was a knight in d3 but now that there is no knight the bishop is just badly placed develop, uh, defending like a weak pawn in b7 and w probably won't be able to live from there for a long time so this would be just like a simple approach to um, simply maintain a better position for white knight c7 also is good though knight c7 rook d8 um, queen f4, here, black played g5, what to do, trying to make sure, is just chasing away that queen to make sure there won't be any attacks going on. And here, Topalov's move surprised me once again. But again, he's an attacking player, he really wanted to keep the queens off, on the board. Had he taken in e5, I feel that this position is positionally so winning for, for white. Why? Because after takes, immediately taking in a6, yes, we are giving the knight for that bad bishop, but what do we manage to get? We manage to get a good bishop versus a bad knight. Why is that? Because there are pawns on both sides of the board. So the bishop is much stronger than the knight, first thing. Then, of course, we've created double pawns, and now... Um, of course, we have to stay a little bit with the rook to protect a5, but after that, uh, we can have some ideas to get the rook active either on c6 or c7, like maybe playing first rook a1 to make sure there won't be any activity going on in the first rank, and then thinking about rook c6. And white has nothing to fear in this position. It's just such a good position for white. Instead, Topalov played queen b4, trying to keep the queens on the board a little bit longer, but but with this, he actually gave Girianish counterplay, a lot of counterplay. So going from a position that was about equal, then white was so much better, um, here specifically, to a position where black starts getting counterplay, and from here on, uh, Giri played super well, I would say. 
Uh, rook a1, of course, getting the rook back, trying to chase that queen away, but now rook e2. Queen c5. Okay, you are attacking me here and there. That's fine, I just play h6, defend, and what do you do next? And knight takes a6, pawn takes x6. So this finally happened. Um, now um, Topalov played rook b1. Don't, uh, I mean, it was possible to, to actually capture in a uh, 7, and this seems to have been a, an okay uh, continuation for white. I mean, after rook d7, for example, to chase the queen away from the protection of that pawn, I have this really good move, queen b6. So not only am I protecting both my weaknesses, but I'm also, you know, keeping the opportunities open, like that pawn attack, this knight kind of attack, so you can move your queen. There are some checks on the last rank. So this position, there seems to be no really good ways for black to chase this queen away. Of course you have rook e6, but okay, then I go queen c5. How much longer will you be able to attack my queen to get it off that diagonal? I mean, you will be able to, but I'll just come back, trade the queens, and then I have uh, would have a pawn up and okay. With a little bit of technique, maybe I'll be able to win. If not, at least, again, I have nothing to fear. Rook b1 is still okay, chasing that queen away. Bishop f3, knight e4. But here, as you can see, black got so much counterplay. And now white is will have to struggle defending both f7, the queen, sacrifices in g3. So Topalov, in this position, he just blundered. He went for the pawn. This was the mistake. I mean, uh, he probably felt he had a great position, and this happens to a lot of us. We feel that we have a great position, and we just forget that things can change as we go along, and we might mess up, or our opponent might mess up, and we have to really play the position that's on the board, not something that's in our head that would be a great thing. So here, he just had to take the knight. I mean, this is the only chance for white to survive here, just take the knight and then possibly try to utilize the weaknesses around black's king and maybe put your queen in f5, for example. Just defend that pawn, keep the queen active, think of some ideas to activate your rook on the 7th or on the 6th, and, you know, Topalov should have nothing to fear in this position. He's slightly better with white. After queen takes f8, 7, which was a blunder, Kiryanish immediately utilized his chance to win this game, to transform this game into... A win and he gave away the rook just for a second because now check what to do if we go king h1 after queen takes e2 i'm threatening some mates around here there knight f2 stuff everything is just hanging and white pieces are too far away to actually be able to protect the king and after king f1 queen d5 happened and now the knight is controlling those two squares. We obviously threaten a mate in one. Quite simple to see. Uh, Bishop h5 was to pile of choice. And here, after a couple more moves, 94 check. White resign. Mate is coming soon. So um, this was the game that I had as a bonus for you guys. I really hope you enjoyed it and had a lot to learn. Be sure to stay tuned for more tomorrow. Bye.